Praise the Lord. <clears throat> Let's just praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's just lift our hearts to heaven and praise the Lord. Let's just praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's just lift our hearts to heaven and praise the Lord. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to you, oh my soul, rejoice, take joy, my King, in what you hear, may it be a sweet, sweet sound, Lord, we do love you. Lord Jesus, thank you for obeying the Father and giving up the glories of heaven and coming to earth to take on the form of a man that you might take our sins upon yourself, shed your blood that our sins might be washed away, gave up your life that we might have eternal life. And now you are alive in heaven where you are interceding for us, praying for us, and preparing a place for us. Oh, Lord, we look forward to the joys of being with you. Now, I pray that you would help us to shut out all of the busyness of our lives and just focus on what you want to teach us today. In the precious and powerful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Will you open your Bibles, please, to the book of Philippians? Now, in Paul's letter to the church at Philippi, he tells us how to live a joyful Christian life. At least 19 times in these four chapters, Paul mentions joy or rejoicing or gladness. Now, the unusual thing about this letter is that there appeared to be no reason for him to be rejoicing. Acts 28 indicates that Paul was under house arrest, chained to a Roman soldier. Yet, in spite of the danger and discomfort, Paul overflowed with joy. So what was the secret of his joy? Well, the secret is found in another word that is often repeated in Philippians. It's the word mind. Paul uses mind ten times, and he also used the words think and remember. And we will learn that the secret of Christian joy is not found in the way a believer feels, but in the way he thinks. Right thinking depends upon what we put into our minds, and the best thing we can put into our minds is the word of God. In John 15, 11, Jesus said, These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. Now, since you are in Bible study, you are off to a good start to the joy of living. Now, Satan cannot rob you of your salvation but he can rob you of the joy of your salvation if you let him. Warren Wiersbe is one of my favorite authors and commentators, and he has written a delightful book titled Be Joyful. And in it, he tells of four thieves that try to rob you of your joy. One thief is the circumstances of life. You know, most of us must admit that when things are going our way, we feel a lot happier and we're much easier to live with. But it's a fact of life that most circumstances are not under our control. 
We have no control over the weather or traffic or the things other people say and do. So if your happiness depends on ideal circumstances, you're going to be miserable most of the time. Yet Paul is in the worst of circumstances, writing a letter that is filled with joy. Another thing that can rob you of your joy is people. Now, all of us have lost our joy because of what other people say and do. My loved ones often say or do things that bring me down into a pit of depression. I want so much to be able to fix them and make them do what I think they should do, and then everybody would be happy. So people can certainly rob us of our joy. Another thief that can rob us of our joy is things. You know, most people think that if they just had certain things, they would be happy. A bigger house, a boat, a new car, the list is endless. But the trouble with things is there's always something newer and bigger and better. Think computers and cell phones. And some of those things can actually rob us of our joy. Then the worst thief of all is worry. Now, I am ashamed to confess that sometimes I am more of a worry warrior than a prayer warrior. And if we're honest, most of us would have to admit that at times we have been robbed of our peace and joy because of worry. Now, if Paul had wanted to worry, he had plenty to worry about. He was a political prisoner facing possible execution. But in spite of his circumstances, Paul does not worry. Instead, he writes a letter filled with joy. So how do we capture the four thieves of circumstances, people, things, and worry, and keep them from taking away the joy that is rightfully ours in Christ? Well, in his letter to the Philippians, Paul says, we must cultivate the right kind of mind. In chapter 1, he says we must develop a single mind, that is, a mind that is devoted to Christ. Now, Paul's circumstances cannot rub, rob him of his joy because he is living to serve Jesus Christ. He's not the prisoner of Rome. He is the prisoner of Jesus Christ. It's as if Paul says, it makes no difference where I am or what happens to me. Just as long as Christ is glorified and the gospel is shared with others. Now, let's, before we look at chapter 1, let's review the background of the church at Philippi. Philippi was located in the modern country of Greece. And it was the first European church planted by Paul. Now, Philippi evidently had a very small Jewish population because there was no synagogue there. Before a synagogue could be established, there had to be 10 Jewish men who were heads of households. And that's why when Paul and Silas came to Philippi, they found some women praying on the riverbank. And Paul preached the gospel to them, and Lydia, who was a wealthy merchant dealing in expensive purple dyed goods, became a believer. It is believed that Lydia was Paul's first convert to Christ in Europe. And it's likely that the Philippian church met in her home. Well, it didn't take long for satanic opposition to arise in the person of a demon-possessed, fortune-telling slave girl. Paul cast the demon out of her, but this enraged the girl's masters who could no longer sell her services as a fortune teller. So they hauled Paul and Silas before the city's magistrates, claiming that they were a threat to Rome. The magistrates had Paul and Silas beaten and put into prison. But that night, God sent a powerful earthquake and all the jail cells were opened. Now this put the fear of God in the jailer's heart, and he and his household were saved. And the next day, the magistrates panicked when they learned that 
they had illegally beaten and imprisoned two Roman citizens. So they begged Paul and Silas to leave Philippi. Well, ten years had passed since the day Paul left Philippi. Now, when the saints at Philippi heard that Paul was in Rome under house arrest, their hearts went out to him, and they dispatched their pastor, Epaphroditus, with a financial gift. So Paul wrote this letter to thank the church and to express his love for them. He had no doctrine to correct, neither did he have to correct their conduct. He simply shared his heart with them. Now, this letter was likely written around 62 or 63 A.D. It was near the end of Paul's first imprisonment in Rome. Now look at verses 1 and 2. Paul wrote this letter to all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi. Now, we don't know how many believers were at Philippi. We know that Lydia was a member of the church there, the slave girl who was delivered from demon possession, and also the jailer and his family were members of this church. Now, notice that Paul addressed the letter to all the saints in Christ Jesus. Every believer is a saint. J. Vernon McGee says, <clears throat> the human family is divided into two, group, two groups, the saints and the ain'ts. The word saint simply means a set-apart one. Now, when you placed your faith and trust in Christ as your Savior, you belong to Him and you have been set apart for His glory. At the moment you believed, you were placed in Christ his spirit came to live inside you, so Christ is in you. Now look at verses 3 to 6. Now I find it remarkable that Paul is thinking of others as, as he awaits his trial in Rome. His mind goes back to the believers in Philippi, and every remembrance brings him joy. He didn't say this to the other churches. Now, not everything that happened to Paul in Philippi was an occasion of joy. In Acts 16, Luke tells us Paul was illegally arrested and beaten and taken to prison and placed in the stocks. But even those memories brought joy to Paul because it was through his suffering that the jailer found Christ. No doubt Paul recalled Lydia and her household and the poor slave girl who had been demon-possessed and the other dear Christians at Philippi who supported him financially and emotionally. They were partners with Paul in the sharing of the gospel. You know, all of us cannot be preachers or missionaries. Not all of us can go on mission trips. But all of us can be partners in their ministries by praying for them and supporting them with our financial gifts and our words of encouragement and appreciation. Now, you should have verse 6 underlined in your Bible. If you are a believer, if you are in Christ, Christ has done the good work of salvation in you. Now, God did the work of saving you when he sent his one and only son to earth to die and pay the penalty for your sins and mine. Your part was to believe in Christ and accept his free gift of pardon. Now, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. God saved us, and he keeps us saved until our salvation is brought to completion on the day Jesus takes us to heaven. Now, God is working in us today by his Holy Spirit to grow us into what he wants us to be. Now, sculptors and woodcarvers have a term for the artist's ability to look at a rough piece of stone or wood and see it in its final perfected form. It is called hyper-seeing. 
How many of you have been to Mount Rushmore National Memorial in South Dakota? Several of you. Well, Gutzon Berglum, Borglum was the sculptor who created that masterpiece. And when his housekeeper first saw the massive faces of the four United States presidents on Mount Rushmore, she asked, Mr. Borglum, how did you know Mr. Lincoln was in that rock? Well, hyper-seeing is what our all-seeing God does when he sees what we shall be like when he has completed his work in us. You know, God is not only the giver of life. He is the changer of lives. And God can turn a mess into a masterpiece. Some of you may remember the song that children used to sing in Sunday school called He's Still Working on Me. It goes like this. He's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. It took him just a week to make the moon and the stars, the sun and the earth and Jupiter and Mars. How loving and patient he must be, because he's still working on me. And you know, Ruth Graham had these words engraved on her gravestone, and I quote, End of construction. Thank you for your patience. You know, one day we will stand before God in the exact likeness of Jesus Christ. Just think, we will be just like Jesus. That should make cold chills go up your back. <laughs> so be submissive and let him work on you. Now in verses 7 and 8, Paul longed to be reunited with his fellow believers in Philippi. They had helped him to spread the gospel by supporting him financially, and Paul remembered them with affection. He had them in his heart, and he faithfully prayed for them. Now look at verses 9 to 11. Now Paul always took time to pray for people. Here he prays that his friends will become mature Christians who will grow in love and knowledge and depth of insight. He prays that they will be able to discern what is best. You know, just because something is good does not mean it is the best thing for us. We cannot do every good work that is presented to us. We have to use discernment to know where we can best use the talents and abilities and gifts and energy and resources that God has given to us. We need to be careful not to become involved in so many activities that we cannot do any of them well. We should focus on what is best and then do our best. We also have to use discernment when we support various ministries. Many of them may be good, but we cannot support all of them. So we have to ask God to show us the best ministries that he wants us to support. Ladies, ask God for wisdom and discernment to recognize those ministries that are padding their own pockets and building big names and bank accounts for themselves. We are responsible to use wisely the money and financial resources that God has entrusted to us. Then Paul also prays that the Philippians will be pure and blameless until the day Christ returns. Christians should live lives of moral purity. We shouldn't be involved in immoral sexual relationships. We should be honest in our dealings with others. We should be truthful. We should not do or say anything that would cause others to stumble. Notice that Paul says we are to be blameless. He doesn't say sinless, but blameless. That means we confess our sins and repent of them so that we will not be ashamed when Christ returns for us and we see him face to face. Then in verse 11, Paul also prays that the Philippian believers might be filled and fruitful. Now, what is the fruit God wants to see from our lives? Well, certainly he wants the fruit of the Spirit. Christian character that glorifies God. 
In Romans, Paul compares winning lost souls to Christ to bearing fruit. And he also names holiness as a spiritual fruit. In Colossians, he exhorts us to be fruitful in every good work. And the writer to the Hebrews reminds us that our praise is the fruit of the lips. Spiritual fruit, whichever it is, brings glory to Jesus Christ. Whenever we do anything in our own strength, we have a tendency to boast about it. But we cannot claim credit for true spiritual fruit. It is a work that only God can do, and the glory must go to God alone. Now look at verses 12 to 14. More than anything else, Paul's desire as a missionary was to preach the gospel in Rome, the key city of that day. It would mean reaching millions with the message of salvation. Now, Paul wanted to go to Rome as a preacher, but instead he went as a prisoner. However, instead of hindering the gospel, Paul's imprisonment actually advanced the gospel. The same God who used Moses' rod and Gideon's pitchers and David's sling used Paul's chains to accomplish his work. To begin with, the chains gave Paul contact with the lost. He was chained to a Roman soldier 24 hours a day. Now, the shifts changed every six hours, which meant Paul could witness to at least four men each day. He literally had a captive audience. And some of these soldiers put their faith in Christ, and they went back to the Praetorian Guard and told the other soldiers what had happened. In this way, Paul was able to get the gospel into the palace of Caesar something he could, not have been, he could not have done had he been a free man. I wonder if Paul thought about Joseph as he reflected on his chains. In Genesis 50, 20, Joseph said, You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. And even though Paul was in chains, the gospel could not be bound. For two years, the guards heard Paul pray, preach, and dictate letters. And many souls were saved. Ladies' problems have a way of becoming pulpits in the overwhelming providence of God. And we need to learn a lesson from Paul when our focus is on Christ, we will look at our circumstances as God-given opportunities for the furtherance of the gospel. We will rejoice at what God is going to do instead of complaining about what God did not do. You may not know it, but Joy of Living Bible Studies came about because a, a woman named Doris Gregg had a serious heart condition and was bound to her bed for a year. Now, she had been a teacher of the Word, and she thought, what am I going to do lying here in this bed? During that year, she wrote the first Joy of Living Bible study. So God took her bed and brought us blessings. Well, Paul's chains not only gave contact with the lost, but they gave courage to the saved. Now, many of the believers in Rome were encouraged to speak the word of God more fearlessly. Now, the word speak does not mean preach. Rather, it means just everyday conversation. You and I don't have to preach or teach publicly. We need only to witness of the work of Christ in our lives in our everyday circumstances. Share with others answers to prayer. Tell them how God has given you wisdom or strength or met a specific need. Speak up and give God the glory. Cleta just shared with me how God worked in her surgery. I'm glad, she will be glad to share it with you, but it's something God did, and she gives God the glory. 
So when others see your joyful attitude in your circumstances, believers will take courage and the lost will want what you have. Well, not only did God use Paul's chains, he also used Paul's critics to advance the gospel. Look at verses 15 to 19. Now, if you serve Christ and speak up for him, there will always be those who will oppose you and criticize you. But just keep on serving and speaking, and God will take care of your critics. You know, most preachers have pure and sincere motives, but there will always be those who preach the gospel with wrong motives to further their own selfish purposes. They want to build a ministry to make a name for themselves. They want to build a mega church or they pad their own pockets. But Paul was able to rejoice in the fact that for whatever the reasons, Christ was being preached. There was no envy in Paul's heart. You know, someone said, there is no limit to the amount of good a man can do if he does not mind who gets the credit. And all that mattered to Paul was that the gospel of Jesus Christ was being preached. You see, God honors his word, not the man or the organization. It's not the messenger, it's the message that goes forth and accomplishes what God desires. Now notice in verse 16, Paul said he was in prison because he was destined to be there by God's will in order to be in a position to proclaim the gospel. And sometimes God puts us in a hard place so we can touch others for Jesus Christ. Well, God not only used Paul's chains and his critics to make the gospel known, he also used Paul's crisis to magnify Christ. Look at verses 20 to 26. Now, there's no doubt that Paul was in a crisis situation. He was in prison awaiting trial. He didn't know whether Caesar would befriend him or behead him. But Paul was not afraid. Whether he lived or died, he wanted to magnify Christ in his body. Now, Paul confesses that he is facing a difficult dilemma. To remain alive was necessary for the benefit of the believers in Philippi, for there was still much work to do. But to depart and be with Christ was his heart's desire. Now, the word depart is interesting. It was used by soldiers where it meant to take down your tent and move on. Now, the tent we believers live in will be taken down at death. And the spirit goes home to be with Christ in heaven. But then sailors also used the word depart, where it meant to loosen a ship and set sail. But departure was also a political term. It described the setting free of a prisoner. And departure was used by farmers to mean to unyoke the oxen. Now, Paul had taken Christ's yoke upon himself. So to depart meant that he would lay aside the burdens of his earthly work and go to be with Christ. Now, let's apply verse 21 to ourselves. For to me, to live is, and you fill in the blank. And to die is, you fill in the blank. Is it to live is to make money, and to die is to leave it all behind? Is it to live is to become famous, and to die is to be forgotten? Is it to live is to have fun, and to die is to go into oblivion? What is living to you? Paul found all of life's meaning in Christ. For Paul, the only reason to remain in this world was to bring souls to Christ and build up believers to do the same. Living for Christ is what makes life worth living. 
Well, Paul has talked about the furtherance of the gospel. Now in verses 27 to 30, he gives several encouragements to help the Christian to defend the faith of the gospel. He said believers should speak and act in such a way that Christ is glorified. And the most important weapon against the enemy is not a powerful sermon or a stirring book. It is the godly life of a believer. Paul admonishes us to behave the way a child of God ought to behave. We Christians are citizens of heaven, and while we live on earth, we ought to behave like heaven's citizens. So a good question for us to ask ourselves on a daily basis is this. Am I living in such a way that others can see Jesus in me? Someone once asked Mahatma Gandhi, What is the greatest hindrance to Christian missions in India? And Gandhi replied, Christians. We need to remember that the world around us knows only the gospel that it sees in our lives. Someone said that the only Bible some people will ever read is you. Listen to this little poem. You are writing a gospel, a chapter each day. By the deeds that you do and the words that you say. Men read what you write, whether faithful or true. Just what is the gospel according to you? Now, if you are a believer, you have discovered that living the Christian life is not easy. It's not a rose garden with all blossoms and no thorns. Every day is a battle against the enemy. But these battles prove that we are saved. For some reason, I was 11 years old when I was saved. But when I got saved, I thought I wasn't going to sin anymore. Now, where I got that idea, I don't know. But it didn't take long for me to discover otherwise. And I was devastated. You know, many new believers have the idea that trusting Christ means the end of their troubles. But in reality, it means the beginning of new battles. And these battles prove that we are saved, that we're making an impact for Christ. We've been deemed worthy to share in the sufferings of Christ. After all, he suffered for us. And the very least we can do is to show our love and gratitude to him, is to be willing to suffer for him. But it should encourage us to know that other believers are experiencing the same conflicts. You know, Satan wants us to think that we're alone in the battle, that our problems are unique, that no one else has it as rough as we do, and that's not true. As long as we live in these bodies on this earth, we're going to have troubles, but we need to accept these troubles as opportunities to grow in Christ and be a blessing to others. God will give us the strength we need to stand firm against the enemy, and this confidence is proof to Satan that he will lose And we are on the winning side. So this week, ask God to work in and through your circumstances to bring good to others and glory to God. When God puts us in hard places, it's often because people are there. They're watching us. People who need to be touched for him. You see, our pain can be a platform to share Christ. In Romans 8, 28, Paul wrote, We know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. So when our minds are focused on Christ, we can have joy in the midst of our circumstances. And life's greatest joy is the sure hope of heaven. Do you have that joy? Let's pray. Oh, Father, we've learned a lot today. Oh, we want to work out those challenges that Paul has presented to us. But we're weak. But you've told us that your strength is made perfect or complete in our weakness, that you will do the work in us and for us by your spirit. So this week, Lord, help us to live so that others see Jesus in us. And they will want what we have. I pray this in his name. Amen.